Have your Bibles. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5 today. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to begin in just a moment reading in verse 22. As you turn there on December 3rd, 1992, something happened that forever changed how we communicate. A man named Neil Papworth sent the first text on that morning. And texting has revolutionized how we communicate. Initially, I'll be honest, I held out. You know I'm going to hold out. I have a dumb phone still today anyway. And I thought and I said, how is this going to work? You can't supplant verbal communication. It's too impersonal. I was dead wrong. The average person today spends 26 minutes texting every day compared to only 21 minutes talking on the phone. And a person is 209% more likely in our day to respond to a text than a voicemail. So if you have an unanswered voicemail, maybe you should try texting. But this relatively newfound way of communicating while it can be beneficial, does have some negative aspects. For instance, a text can be hard for the recipient to discern. You might say something in sarcasm or something very serious, yet without the inflection of a voice, an individual may not understand the real meaning behind it. But I believe the greatest infringement that texting has brought upon society, at least in our country, is what it has done to the English language, the grammatical rules, these beautiful rules of grammar that we have for the English language have just been thrown out the window and replaced with expedient gobbledygook sometimes, I guess. Sometimes it's even unrecognizable. But that's not the only thing that's really been affected in our society in the last couple of decades, and really it's not just in texting. But there's been an attack in the last couple of decades that really is far more impactful than the subtle attack that texting has brought to the English language, and it's this, the attack on God's view of the home an attack on the sacred institution of marriage. Modern man, defying God, has sought to redefine marriage, what marriage is, how a family is to act. Society, by its very nature, is not helping marriages, not helping families, not helping children. Hollywood trivializes, many times mocks, biblical marriage. The gambling and pornographic industries, if you call it that, offenders against the family have not been restrained by our government, but they're enabled more and more as time passes. But I appeal to you this morning that the attack on the family had a seed that came long before these last two decades. It came long ago when man began to define the roles in marriage, the responsibility of the husband and the wife in marriage. It sounds like it's a very small thing, but once they said, well, there are no gender distinctions in the marriage, and once that was accepted, we shouldn't be surprised today to see the confusion over gender. Not just gender roles, but actually what constitutes gender. I was reading this past week an illustration that depicts how that seed of trying to reject the roles in the home can lead to something far worse. Someone said, imagine leaving Los Angeles and flying to Rome, Italy. It takes about 12 hours to fly from L.A. to Rome. However, if you were to fly that plane one degree off center to the south, in 12 hours you would not reach Rome, Italy. You would reach somewhere in Tunisia, Africa. 
It started years ago when people say, I don't agree with this husband being the head of the home. And what has happened is as time has progressed, people have moved further and further away from God's intent in the home. What I share with you today, I share from the heart. It's not what I pontificate, it's the Word of God. And as we look at it today, in a day where we have so much confusion, for us to get our bearings straight, we must return to the Word of God. So with that in mind, look with me at Ephesians 5. In verse 22, it says, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Then look at verse 32. This mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ in the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word today, Lord, we don't have to wonder about the home. Your word gives us your instruction for the home, not the pastor's instruction, not an individual's instruction, Lord, your instruction. But I pray today that your spirit would speak to our hearts as we look at this important subject matter today. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been looking at Paul's sharing of the responsibilities that we as Christians have. You remember the first three chapters, we really, they were, they were doctrinal in focus, and we were looking at truths of the faith. But beginning in chapter 4 and verse 1, Paul is basically saying, okay, in these first three chapters, I'm sharing with you truth, and in these next three chapters, we're going to see what does that mean? How do we live it out? And, and we've been looking at that and that aspect in the past couple of weeks. But today we begin a series of messages on the home. And in and these next 11 or 12 verses, we're going to take three weeks to look at. You say, well, preacher, why did you skip over the responsibility for the husbands when you read? We're going to look at this in an orderly way. This week we're going to look at the responsibilities of the wife. I was chuckling with Tony. He said, you happen to be preaching on submission of the wife when Addie happened to be working in the back, you know, <laughs> and we got a good chuckle out of it. But maybe Tony can find a way to miss next week because next week we're going to be looking at the subject matter of the husband and the husband's responsibility. And I'll add this, husbands. Paul had a lot more to say to us than he did to the wives. And then uh, two weeks from today, we're going to look at the relationship of parents to their children. Why is that? Because the home is still essential. The home is so important. It is God's first institution, predating the nation of Israel, predating the church. God instituted the home. And the home is to be a primary place of instruction, that's verbal instruction, but instruction lifestyle. In fact, one of the blessings that I have is I had a Christian dad. I had a, a, a father who believed in the Lord, and I saw my dad get up and go to work every day. You know, many times we'll criticize people, oh, well, they don't do this, they don't do that. Maybe they didn't see it modeled in a father. Maybe they did not see it modeled in a mother. I had that blessing. The home is essential for teaching. Do you realize that we spend more time in our life really around family, especially in the developmental years, than anyone else? And so today, we're going to look at the wife's responsibility. Next week, we'll look at the husband's responsibility. But today, let's look at the command or the appeal Paul has for wives. Look at verse 22. He says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. You know, when we first hear that, it sort of strikes and we get those negative 
negative connotations of the word submit. And we say, here comes another one of those chauvinistic messages. But we need to realize that God inspired Paul to write these words. These weren't the words of someone's opinion. These are part of scripture. And the verb that forms the command submit is the Greek word hupotasomenoi. That's a five letter or four or five dollar word, more than five letter. But it means really to relinquish one's rights. It speaks to order. God is a God of order. He orders the day, he orders the season, he orders the church, and he orders the home. The late John R. W. Stott noted, submission is a humble recognition of the divine order of things. The, the command submit here, very importantly, is in the middle voice. It's a continuation of verse 21. We read verse 21 last week. It said, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. And so he picks up in verse 22 on that verb, and the responsibility of the wife is that of submitting to her husband. But notice it's in the middle voice. It carries the idea of willingly submitting yourself. It is a voluntary submission. She's the one who is to fully place herself in a position of, of this order in the home. And so Paul, in a way, really, while we use the word command, is actually appealing to the wife. And so as we look at this back in the context, it's important when Paul was writing here in the first century, women rightly were receiving many more rights. There was more equality and rightly so. And so there might have been the thought, okay, now that the rights are equal, that must mean we're the same. We're the same in everything. But that's not what Paul is saying here. He's saying, could it, could it be that the woman could disregard this word, discard this distinction in the context of marriage? And Paul's answer is no. Simply put, God is calling the wife to willingly place herself under the leadership of her husband. And it's very true, and it's very good. Yet in our world today, it sounds foreign. It sounds antiquated, misogynistic. That's a word I had to look up back a few months ago when it first came out. But we need to be so aware, church, the culture every day is trying to define our reality. Not using the word of God, but the opinions of people. The, the, the culture today is trying to influence how we think. And whatever news station you watch, I can guarantee you they're going to paint the world the way they want it to be seen. But we need to hear God's word. I thought about Daniel when he was taken into Babylon. Daniel, the goal of the Babylonian people were, was this, to make Daniel like they were. And so they tried to make him think as they thought, eat as they ate, do as they did. And it tells us in Daniel 1 that he refused to eat the king's food. He says, I will not be impacted by my culture. I will be impacted by what God says. Just because something sounds strange in our ears today does not mean it's wrong. You might be surprised to know there are 60,000 miles of vessels and arteries and capillaries in your body. Think about that, 60,000 miles. If you don't believe me, you look it up. You know what that is? That's 11 trips plus to LA and back from here. Now, when you hear that, you say, that can't be. That's wrong. When you, you're, you, you begin to form how you think. And, and that's what the culture wants us to do with the family. That they, they want us to think, boy, the word of God is foreign. That can't be true. But the reality is what God's word says to us. 
The world will say, the culture will say, submission is a terrible thing. They'll try to, I've seen where they even picture a man dragging a woman by her hair. That's just a caricature. That's not what God's teaching. God is teaching what? He's teaching order. The wife is to submit to her husband as unto the Lord. This means that her motivation is first to live a life pleasing to the Lord. And we're going to look at this motivation before we close today in a general appeal. But I want to look first at, at three things this text does not say. This text does not say that women submit to men. It doesn't teach that. Let's not read into the word what it says. It does not say that a woman uh, he walks out and, and submits to any man. That's not what the scripture. This appeal is in the context of marriage. Who created the institution of marriage? God did. And, and so as we look at it, it is speaking specifically in the context of marriage. It doesn't mean, now unless a male is your boss, it doesn't mean that, say, a female and a male who are, are co-workers and at the same level, not one boss over the other, must submit. There's nowhere the scripture says that. It's the context of marriage. We look back in the fall in the church. Who created the church? The church is God's institution. It's God's organism. What does God say? Uh, the man is to be the spiritual head in the church. That doesn't mean out on the streets with any random person. It is speaking about order in God's institution. And guess what? By the way, God knows how the family works better than Hollywood. He knows how the church works better than anyone. But it does not say that women in general submit to men. But in these institutions... Yes. Secondly, it doesn't mean that the wife is freely able to reject the lordship of Jesus Christ. In other words, the wife say, well, my husband um, lives like this and lives wildly and wants me to live that way. And I'm no. God has an umbrella of authority. God's umbrella is far broader than any human authority. And once human authority totally contradicts God's authority, we must obey God rather than man. With the wife who has an unbelieving husband, and it happens in many cases, I believe God can use her quiet influence, her consistent life to impact her husband. It may take time, and I'll share about that. But if the husband is, is calling a wife to do something illegal, something immoral, something that conflicts with what God says, then even though she is to submit to her husband, her ultimate allegiance is to the Lord. You must follow what the Lord says. But then there's a third thing. It does not say that men are superior to women. That's not what it says. If you believe that, then you're reading wrong. There's nothing here that speaks of value or worth. It speaks of role. It speaks of a role. Uh, I've had uh, the opportunity uh, sometimes to uh, uh, work with middle school sports, and they call the captains out uh, before the game. And, and sometimes the captains aren't even the starting players. I, I was helping with the middle school this year, our shortest guy, who's like a lightning bug. He, he, he didn't start, he wasn't even the first guy off the bench, but he was given what? The role of being a captain. Did it communicate his value? No, it didn't. It, it communicated what his role was, his responsibility in it. And so the distinction here between a, a male and a female is not just cultural because the scripture says that he created them both male and female distinct. And, and people say, well, Paul's just giving a cultural argument. Well, we can't believe that because in 1 Timothy 2.13, as Paul is speaking about the distinction of, of the, the genders, he says, for the man was created first and then the woman. He goes all the way back to creation about the distinction. 
But here he's speaking to the man's responsibility, the woman's response. And it's not a privilege, but a responsibility for the husband to be head in the home. But let's look secondly at the basis for the command. Because he follows that in verse 3. Submit to your husbands. Why, why is that? Because the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. What a beautiful picture. The Lord's love for the church, the church, church's submission to the Lord. Uh, Jesus was head of the church. He was head of believers. But what did he do? Did he go around and pontificate? No, he didn't. He actually washed his own disciples' feet. He served in that leadership. So the basis for the command is the order that God has given. That's what we, we believe. But what Paul is looking for is not some outward adherence, but a heart of humility in the, in, on behalf of the wife that understands that role and follows it in the home. Again, we're not talking about men in general to women or women in general to men in the context of the home. I laughed at the story I'd shared before of a little boy that was being punished. The teacher made him go stand in the corner of the classroom. And of course, he was a spectacle to all the kids. He, he stood there quietly about 10 minutes later. The te teacher says, now, what do you think? And she opened up a can of worms when, when she did that. He, he responded, he said, I may be standing on the outside, but I'm sitting over there on the inside. God doesn't want just an outward adherence. He wants a heart of humility and submission. Why all of this? He says the husband is the head of the wife. It doesn't speak to power. It speaks to position. I was thinking about that this week and think about it. When God created, an, when God created Adam and Eve, he gave man an authority over created order. And, and, and he, what did he do? He said, Adam, I'm going to let you name the animals. That's under your authority. He delegated that authority. He didn't delegate that authority to the home, did he? He didn't say, Adam, I'm going to let you determine how the home is. He did not do it. He didn't do it. He says, I'm going to give you authority over the animals. You can name them. But he didn't say, and oh, let me have an addendum here. You can decide how the family will be ordered. No, the home was so important that God ordered it. So the basis for the command is God's ordained order in the home. You ever been around disorder? I have. And usually when disorder happens, it's because there is not a Head. If you've ever been in a place and, and maybe you've frequented a place and it looks chaotic, it looks a mess, the first thing you think is not who's behind the registers, you think who's the manager here, who's the owner here. Why? Because we understand order is important in the area of efficiency, of effectiveness. And that's what God has done. He has ordered the home. So we've seen the command or the appeal, we've seen the purpose, uh, or we've seen rather uh, the basis for it. But, but finally, I want to look at the purpose that is fulfilled in the command. And wives, this is so important. The wife is to fulfill this responsibility in the home for two primary reasons. One is a positive witness to the glory of God. And two is a demonstrable obedience to the Lord. One is horizontally toward people around us. It's a witness. Secondly is vertical. It demonstrates obedience. First, let's look at the witness, the horizontal aspect. Real quickly, turn to 1 Peter 3. We'll look at verses 1 and 2. 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2, it sounds very similar. In fact, Paul, in about four different places, spoke to order in the home in the New Testament. Paul or, let me add, the other apostles and or. Um, 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2, In the same way, wives, submit yourselves to your own husband. Notice that middle voice again, the, the voluntary submission. So that 
Even if some disobey the word, they may be won over without a word by the way their lives live when they observe your pure and reverent lives. What is it saying? If you're a, a wife who is a Christian and your husband does not really want to have anything to do with God, it doesn't say nag him all the time, make him feel unspiritual, subvert his leadership in the home. It says quietly, quietly live out Christ before it. Why? So that even if they disobey the word, they may be won over without a word. What is that? By your example, when, when he sees something different, it will prompt something. Now, I would love to say it'll happen tomorrow. It often doesn't. I'll share in just a moment. I read a quote that amused me today is a little book. A man named Herbert Abbott had library. I've been blessing of receiving a number of library, uh, libraries from pastors. This was a, a layman. And uh, in this that Herbert Abbott had, this little book, it said, the ability to speak several languages is an asset, but the ability to keep your mouth shut in one language is priceless. <laughs> Let me say it again. The ability to speak several languages is an asset, but the ability to keep your mouth shut in one language is priceless. The benefit of a quiet spirit. I knew a woman in my hometown, in fact, she taught me when I was young, came to church regularly, gentle spirit, loving person. Her husband was well known in the area, was a tough man, great athlete, stern businessman, very little interest in the Lord. This woman, week after week, served the Lord. She didn't badger her husband. She just lived Christ before him. Two years before that man died, every Sunday, he was in God's house. The power of the quiet witness of a loving wife. It, it may not happen this week, but believe it, God works in amazing ways, when we follow what God says, her witness, second, her obedience, we see that really back in 1 Peter 3 and verse 4, but rather what is inside, the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is what? Of great worth in God's sight. It's valuable to God. This, this spirit that the world mocks, God says, is so beautiful to him, God takes pleasure in obedience. So when the wife, in a spirit of gentleness, submits, not in the way the world says, but the way we see described, it's a beautiful thing. I live it every day. My wife lives that. That's why I say it. My wife is beautiful on the outside, but on the inside. And I'm going to tell you, there are many times when I've been convicted without a word from her life, the way she lives, the way she lives. Ladies, it's not a chain in an oppressive thing. It is a beautiful thing to be an instrument in the hand of God with your husband in your family. There's a truth that we need to grasp, especially as time is moving on. And that's why this movement at Asbury is so encouraging to me, to see what's happening. Because God is saying, hey, don't be mistaken, I'm moving. But as we look around this darkened world, and we see the hate, and we see the spite, and we see the bitterness, and we see the grumbling, and the griping, we need to realize the faith of the follower of Jesus Christ is so different. Different from the culture that we're living. Our values are different. Our beliefs are different. Our definitions are different. And as we've seen, we're to live as children of the light. And even how we look at marriages is different. Before we close this first study on the family, I want to note there's a basis for the believer's conduct. Now, we mentioned the basis for the command here uh, is that it, God said, 
God has so ordered that the husband be the home. But there's a basis for all of Christian conduct. If we aren't careful, we'll miss as we look specifically at this area. And it's this. Everything that we do is to be on the basis of our consciousness of God. Are you having a tough time in the workplace? How do you endure it? When you get up in the morning, you say, God, I'm serving you first and then them. Give me grace to get through this day. Are you dealing with a difficult uh, relationship or something? Uh, you say, God, make me conscious of you. Help me hold my tongue when I need to. Help me to speak the right word when I need to. And it's definitely true in the home. And we see it in all four areas we're going to look. Last week, verse 21, submitting to one another, what? In the fear of Christ. It didn't say submitting to one another, period. It said submitting to one another with the consciousness of God, all right? As we move on, verse 22, wives, submit to your husbands. It didn't stop there. As to the Lord. In other words, in, the, in your relationship with your husband, be conscious of me. Next week, we're going to look at the husband's love for the wife as to be what? Like the Lord's love for the church. And then two weeks from today, we'll look at the relationship between children and parents where it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, in the Lord, a consciousness of the Lord because this is right. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children. Bring them up what? In the training and instruction what? Of the Lord. So everything we do, we're conscious of God. Are you dealing in a difficult situation at home? Say, God, I give it to you. God, I'm going to obey your word. It may not happen now, but it will happen. And I'm going to trust you and I'm just going to do what you've called me to do. I don't know today you may have never come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. You will not be able to accomplish everything God desires for your life apart from Him. I don't know how much money you would make, how much fame you might acquire, but I know this on the authority of God's Word. The only way you can live a full life is by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you trusted Him today, are you conscious of the Lord? Are you making the decisions in your life based on the Lord? Or would you say today, I don't know the Lord. I would love to share with you how you could come to know the Lord today. And it's this. Just say, God, I know I'm a sinner. God, show me yourself. God, forgive me of my sin. I repent of my sin. I believe that Jesus came to this earth and died and rose again. I trust in him today. If you've never done that before, would you do it today? Today, to say, God, to be what you want me to be, what I need to be, I want to trust in you. I want to believe in you. Hey, people, he's working. We're seeing signs of it everywhere. Maybe today, as a wife, you're having a tough time. You're, you're trying to be faithful, and you get tired. It's like running that marathon. Hey, God will give you that second win. I, I share that testimony of that lady in my hometown, hopefully as an encouragement to me. When I, when I saw that gentleman sit in that church, I just was as bright-eyed as could be. I couldn't believe it. It was an amazing thing, amazing thing. Be faithful. Be faithful. Don't allow the culture, don't allow the, in culture, the culture to encroach your mindset. Let the Word of God. And let's prove as Daniel did. You know what Daniel did? He said, I'm not going to buy into culture. I'm going to eat my food. And you know what happened? He proved God's way was the best because his diet led him to be stronger and more physically imposing than those who ate the king's diet. God gives us, God gives us his responsibility. God gives us his institution in the home. Let's follow it. Let's pray. Lord, we look at the subject matter of the family. Father, for many of us, we would admit that word submit is like a foreign food to us. But Father, it is a beautiful word when it's understood in the context of the home and of the Christian's attitude toward fellow Christians. Lord, 
Give us grace to be the wives and the husbands, the children and the parents that we need to be in the home. And Father, we will give you the thanks in it. Lord, if there be any today who have not trusted you as Lord and Savior, we pray that you would have your own way today. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn.